I took the whole screen. We're ready to go. Let's see. Everybody in the meeting? I'm not. You're in. Yeah, but where's my, I want my turn. Turn your computer over there. <laughs> You won't need your speaker anyway. You are muted. I think we're getting all the technology straightened out real quick here. Good evening and welcome to the special call meeting of the Smithville R2 School District Board of Education. Uh, tonight, August 12th, uh, there's been a special call meeting to address the situation for the back to school of whether to require masks, uh, universal masking for all students grades K through 12. Uh, with the board, I would accept a motion and a second to approve this meeting and to call this meeting into order. So moved. Second. I've got a motion and a second to approve calling the meeting into order. Please vote. Second. Motion passes unanimously. If you would, please at this time stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, if everybody's had a chance to look at the agenda, is there this is an opportunity to approve or modify the agenda? Does anybody have any issues with the agenda as presented? If not, I'll send a motion and a second to approve the agenda. So moved. Exactly. A motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. Any further discussion? Please vote. Okay, at this time, I just thought I would take a minute uh, and kind of go through the rest of the agenda for the audience. I'm not sure. I can't see the screen. Uh, if they have the agenda on there, but just kind of how the meeting is going to go as far as order. Uh, first thing we need to do is address uh, board policy DDDH, which limits our public comment to 20 minutes with five minutes per speaker. Um, here in just a few minutes, we're going to have a discussion about uh, modifying that policy to allow uh, speakers that have signed up the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, after that, we will have our public comment. Uh, at this time, I have 11 uh, people signed up, and uh, based on what the decision is with modifying policy, we will go from there uh, with the public comment. Once public comment is complete, we will uh, go to item number nine, which is the presentation from Dr. Schutz and the administration regarding the proposal for back to school. 
After that presentation, the board will have a question and answer and an opportunity to share any comments that they want. Uh, that part of the meeting is not uh, an open meeting with the public. That is discussion by the board only. Uh, once all comments and questions have been asked by the board, then the administration will provide their proposal for what they recommend for the start of the 2021-22 school year. And at that point, the board will vote. And that is the last item on the agenda. So we're just gonna try to, to keep this moving. At this time, uh, I'd like to address the board and ask them to consider modifying board policy BADH-1 which currently limits our public participation to 20 minutes. Uh, I think with 11 people signed up to speak, if we go ahead and do the five minutes per speaker, that if we extended that to right at one hour, that we would uh, be okay as far as modifying our policy for this evening's meeting. And knowing that, that uh, anytime that needs to be adjusted, we would take it on a case by case basis. So do I have a motion and a second to extend public comment to 60 minutes with five minutes per speaker? Okay. Got a motion and a second to modify our board policy BDDH-1, and we will allow for the 11 speakers that are currently signed up with five minutes apiece. So if we could, uh, between speakers and stuff, be ready to go, and we will start uh, at this time. Please vote. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Can we give them a hug? Plan on doing it like a baseball game on deck and in the hall. <laughs> so please vote. Okay, motion passes unanimously. We will extend our public comment to one hour uh, with five minutes per speaker. 8.0, 8.1 are comments for the audience. Uh, first up is Dr. Michael Krim. Next would be Jake Petkevich, and then Delenn Siegel. Delenna Siegel, sorry. Good evening, my name is Michael Prim and I have three children in the school district. Most, if not everyone in this room, believe it is very important for the children in the Smithfield Public School District to have access to in-person education for the entire school year. The best chance for safety and success involves beginning with a universal mask mandate. This is not a political statement. This is a public health imperative. SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant is known to be much more contagious than its predecessor. Unvac unvaccinated and vaccinated people are thought to spread the virus. Uh, yeah, I've got the mic on. It should be on the Zoom session. Oh, sorry, oh, the mic. Yep, yep, sorry. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I had the Zoom going, but not the microphone. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm going to reset. Most, if not everyone in this room, believe that it is very important for children in the Smithville Public School District to have access to in person education for the entire school year. The best chance for safety and success involves beginning with a universal mask mandate. This is not a political statement, it is a public health imperative. SARS CoV 2 Delta variant is known to be much more contagious than its predecessor. Vaccinated and unvaccinated people alike are thought to spread the virus. The virus can be spread before people have symptoms, and we know that sick children go to school all the time. Children under 12 have yet to be vaccinated and are developing more severe disease and being hospitalized. Hospitals are overwhelmed with lack of available medical beds and staffing shortages. People who have urgent need for other medical services are having to wait. We have lost more people to this virus in 18 months than all major wars in the 20th century. Without social distancing measures that were enacted earlier in the pandemic, over a million Americans were projected to have been lost. Why have we become so apathetic to this reality? We 
We seem to care more about life lost on my brother or in World War II than the ongoing onslaught brought by the pandemic. We lost over 3,000 Americans on 9 11, and we had a weekly death toll averaging 3,300 Americans daily this past January. On average, we lost about 250 servicemen daily in World War II, and we are currently losing over 500 Americans daily to this virus. Some many of us are not shocked by this. I think we have become somehow come to the conclusion that we have nothing to do with it, but we do. We are the ones spreading the virus. Some of us care whether we spread the virus, and some of us seem to care less. The late Senator Moynihan from New York once famously said, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. It is a well-established fact that mass significantly reduces the transmission of viruses, yet many people falsely claim that masks are no good. This is simply not true. This is an opinion, not a fact. Many mass opponents state that masks don't work because they know people who have become infected despite wearing masks. They also see that children often do not wear masks properly, but this is a false narrative. These arguments suggest that if something is not 100% effective, then it shouldn't be done. Nothing could be further from the truth. No one suggests that all people wearing seatbelts are safe from dying in car accidents, but statistically, you know you're much safer wearing one in laws mandate this. Many mask opponents raise a false flag of freedom when they say, but they alone as parents have the freedom and the right to choose whether a child goes to public school with a mask on. What these parents are not saying explicitly is that they want to be allowed to send little Jenny to her crowded dance and gymnastics class, become infected, and then send them to school without a mask and infect other students, unsuspecting students, and teachers and staff and the community at large. The freedom or choice that they are demanding is to be allowed to behave in a reckless and irresponsible way that could seriously endanger those around. Thomas Jefferson wrote that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As American citizens, we do not have the right to behave in ways that intentionally or willfully jeopardize the health of others. This is not a personal freedom of choice we get to make. This is a false flag of freedom. I wonder what the parents of these maskless children would say if I claim that it is my personal right to allow my son to smoke in the classroom next to their child. Which behavior do you believe poses the greater or more imminent risk to life? The CDC and Clay County Public Health recommend universal masking in school. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends universal masking as the best possible option for a safe and successful return to full time in person learning. Why would we not follow the best advice? As adults, we often weigh the risks and benefits of big decisions in our lives. This is a big decision, but it should be easy. For the downside of masking is minimal, but the potential benefits of masking are very high. These are the facts. Dr. Angela Myers, Division Director for Infectious Disease and Children's Mercy, has said, We would be crazy not to mask. Why is it that wearing a mask has come to represent anything other than care and respect for fellow human beings? Let's do the right thing for our children. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. JP Cabbage, Elena Siegel, you are next, and then Whitley Carlisle. Whitley Carlisle. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. Thank you again for having me back. Before I begin with that side, then I just want to quickly uh, get on record just a moment of importance for one of our students and their friends and family uh, that died tragically this week. Uh, nothing more than old or ideological about this. It's a sad moment for all of us. And our hearts and thoughts go out to their family's family. I was here three weeks ago, or rather, two moments over, to speak to you regarding the uh, mask mandate. Delta variant was raging then and is raging even further now. Seems like we're now trying to address this directly. So, I'm going to do what I can to help you out. In lieu of vaccination, masks work. They work mostly by protecting each other. There was some confusion last time to see, like, by the board members, by communities, and how masks work. This is from the CDC, March 2020. We had this information for 17 months. The article compiled in 10 studies shows 78% of moisture particles 
which is where the virus is, are trapped by cloth masks, and most others are broken up to minimize breakage for a couple of weeks. This is the reason why surgeons, ER doctors, wear masks. It is not to protect them from their patients. It is to protect their patients from the germs that the doctors might spread. We wear masks to protect each other during the pandemic. And to be realistic, the notion of parental choice and masks optional in schools means no one's wearing masks. I was a substitute teacher. I saw the day after you dropped the mask mandate in May, there were no masks. Number two, this is going to hit our children harder than before. Children's Mercy last Thursday had, among all of their other patients, 12 COVID cases. By Tuesday, they had 22 in five days, seven of them ranging from infants all the way to teenagers or any ICD-1 ventilators. An 11-month-old with COVID in Houston had to be airlifted out of the Houston area because they had no beds for her. As of last week, Arkansas has 25 ICD beds left in their entire state. The state of Mississippi, six. And speaking of Arkansas, Arkansas passed a mask mandate ban through their legislature. Schools went back to school two weeks ago. What was the result? The Marion School District has 2,000 total people, students and staff. 950 of them last week were in quarantine. 65 of them were positive. Some are concerned that their child's mental health in a mask might suffer as a result of being in school, but that is not the case. Psychology study after psychology study, and pediatricians will tell you masks don't cause mental health problems, quarantines do. Next, since just to get the emotional stuff out of the way, I present this picture to evidence. This is why. Why was a five year old in Georgia? Why a perfectly normal kid, ready to go to kindergarten, no pre existing conditions whatsoever? Ended up in the hospital with COVID, had out of control pneumonia, exacerbated by COVID, stroked out and died. Yes, healthy children are less likely to die from COVID. But should we not also be protecting those that are weaker than us, too, those of failing health, heart conditions? Any students have asthma? How about diabetes? What about if you're immune from compromised or on immune suppressants? Those are all high risk categories. Do I want to send my child into an unmasked school to play COVID Russian roulette just because we as a community won't wear a mask to keep her safe? There's a pediatrician running for Blue Valley School Board that's all against the COVID protocol in our schools anti mask, anti quarantine. She's probably somebody that some, someone from the other side might quote today. When Dr. Christine White was questioned by the news, about what do you do about high risk people? She said, quote, if you are a high, if you are a high risk individual, then you can decide to remove yourself from society in order to avoid contracting coronavirus. Is this who we become? Is this how we take care of the best of us? My tax dollars pay for the schools like everyone else. If we, if we enforce masks, children will be inconvenienced but safe. If people are given a choice, your child not wearing a mask forces the issue to be between public education and public life. I respect parental choice in normal times, but these are not normal times. These are unprecedented times. We need to be better than just good parents and good, good educators. We need to be good neighbors and we need to be good citizens. I urge the board, please follow the guidelines of the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Lake County Health Board. Please reinstitute mask mandate at the beginning of the 2021 school year. Thank you. Thank you. Selena Siegel, Whitney Carlisle, and JC Carlisle. Yeah, Whitney? Yep. <laughs> With all due respect, our actions speak louder than our words. Um, my name is Whitney Carlisle, I'm mother of four, including two um, Smith Hill School District students. Thank you for moving the meeting to this location and reviewing policy to allow for more public comment time. It shows you do care and understand that the people hold the power in government and our voices should be heard. 
Last night, the Clay County Health Department made it very clear and further discussed that their guidelines to the schools were recommendations, not mandates. From math and guidelines to quarantine policy, they are recommendations, not mandates. The health department chair explained, quote, we are providing guidance to the schools. They are then the ones who make the decisions about whether to go with what we're saying. So whether they accept that or deviate from it. Again, they gave school districts the ability to decide what is best for their students. This would include the decision to allow families to decide to mask or not, and also the rules we choose to follow about quarantine. During this Carney School District meeting this week, much of the discussion to wear or not wear masks was not necessarily about the health of the student, but more, we have to wear them so they don't have to quarantine. It was not, they protect the kids from COVID, but they protect them from being sent home. I think we can do better. We can come up with a better solution. Other schools have done this, we can too. We can decide those who test positive or show symptoms must quarantine. Maybe it's those who are wearing a mask do not need to quarantine. I'll take the odds of a week of quarantine to a school year of no mask. Those who have a positive antibody test should not have to quarantine. If you think it is wrong to send healthy kids home for 10 to 14 days, you can make those changes. Again, the Clay County Health Department intentionally used words in their guidance to allow school boards to do what is best for their community, for our kids at Smithville. I have asked multiple times how many of those summer school quarantines resulted in sick kids. I have not gotten a number. I heard from various teachers and parents how ridiculous the process of sending kids home was. One said, they just sent home the entire class and that was that. I do not feel like summer school is an accurate way to judge no masking, as I have yet to hear actual numbers to prove the quarantine of those classes was necessary. The opposing side would say, trust the ex experts. For this purpose, let's use Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour expert rule. With this, we are in a room full of experts in the field of parenthood. I have clocked in 101,825 hours and counting as a mom. Let me tell you what the experts don't see. They don't see every single day their kid getting in the car from school pickup while ripping up their mask saying, finally, I can breathe. They aren't seeing the emotional or isolated feelings that come from going hours and hours, day after day, not seeing a smile. I want you to remember so while these experts can go into their office to pull down their masks, our kids do not get to do that. I recently asked my pediatrician how COVID was in their office. Her reply, it actually hasn't been that bad. You know what has increased though? Anxiety and depression in our kids and teens. It doesn't take a medical degree to see that masks are affecting our kids. While subbing in a high school class, I asked a student during their free time, is it always this quiet? Her reply was, just since COVID. I mean, who wants to talk with a mask on? If the masks aren't a big deal for our students, then why was school completely different on the day they could come off last year? You might feel like your vote tonight to allow parents the choice to mask or not is going against the experts. But what about the parent experts? I say proof was shown what our parents felt was best for our kids. When, from what I saw in the school building the next day, 90% of kids came in maskless when given the choice. Please let us parents, the ones who know our kids individually and love them more than anyone, to make that decision. Let's look at children's mercy numbers. As of last night, there are 14 COVID parents patients. While I am heartbroken for those 14, that is 14 out of 150 counties children mercy serves. 14, 150 counties. Really concerned about the health of our kids? Give them an extra recess to get 15 more minutes of vitamin D. More time being active in PE. Give them tools to build up their immune system. Educate so if they do get sick now or as adults, they can be a healthy weight and know how to live an active, healthy lifestyle. After the last board meeting, my daughter looked at me and said, next time I'm speaking. She wrote her speech all on her own. She is learning firsthand here tonight more than any textbook will teach her about the way government works, that we, the people, hold the power. People fought and died for the right to make decisions for ourselves and our families. You can give recommendations and lay out all information. Let's come up with logical solutions to the quarantine guidelines and allow parents the opportunity to choose for themselves what is best for their child. Thank you.
Uh, Brooke Perkins and then Brianna Robinson. Hi, my name is Jason Carlisle. I'm a driver elementary school and I live on 14601 Mount Holloway. I'm going into sixth grade and I would really love to see my teacher and friends, please. I don't want to spend another year going to the bathroom just to get a mattress. Well, this is sixth grade. This is the awkward year where everyone sits, symbols, and braces, and I do not want to. Last year, it came down to the last day she needed school and we got to the mattress. I don't think I've ever enjoyed school so much. It felt like the first day of school day. You are here to help make the right decision for our childhood. Please let us have the choice. Thank you. Good purpose for Ian Robinson and Sandy Bay White. And Brooke Perkins. Thanks for having us again. Um, I just want to start off by saying all we have cared about for the last almost two years is, is COVID. And to say that we don't care about COVID and the deaths and the cases is a false claim or opinion. Um, I want to start out by saying recently the CDC, which is what everybody wants to refer to, has reported that COVID cases in children is up to 4 million plus cases with 350 plus deaths. Those are numbers we can't ignore, but these are also numbers we should not ignore. 3,999,650 survivors and counting. Every day we get to see the numbers of and rising in cases and the numbers of deaths and death is horrible. And I'm not taking away from that, but let's start looking at it as positive. Increases in survival, that's what's happening. We're surviving it, we're learning to live with it, we need to know how to move on with our lives and live with COVID because it's not going away. I did send the board some graphs that show several countries and several states and comparative views of mask mandates and rising cases of, of COVID in all of those areas. And you can see in all of those graphs that once the mask mandate is implemented and enforced up to 98% enforcement in Japan, for example, COVID did not care. It did what COVID did. It rose and fell, and there was no, it did not care about mass media. So you can see that comparatively, lots of other states, even ones with reduced mass mandates or none at all, still had the same graphs or even less cases than those surrounding them with same COVID cases. And you can actually click the link on the public comments and see it. I did pass out a few packets today, and the board will have seen some of those. I check all of those against the CDC maps as well. The data is the same. It's just that these ones tell you when the maps were implemented and when they were lifted, or if they're still implemented today. Number, my next thing I want to talk about is that it's not clear this to wearing seatbelts. This is not a seatbelt case. Seatbelts have been around forever. You can see definitively that they are saving the price. This is not comparable to that. This is a changing situation. All the time, and it's, it's just you can't compare an apple to an orange. That's going to break to me. Um, but again, you can refer to those graphs and see definitively that maps make no difference against COVID. Uh, doctors and nurses in their environment will have to go to work every day. If they're exposed to COVID, they continue to go to work and they check in twice a day to confirm if they have symptoms or not. They don't even COVID test, they continue to go to work until they begin exhibiting symptoms. I think this is something maybe we can adopt as a, if you guys lift the mask mandate for students, I think that's something we could kind of avoid long quarantines that are not unnecessary sending healthy, healthy kids home. Um, I think that's basically all I have to say is that again, it's, it's a ch choice. And uh, I think that it definitively at the end of the year last year, everybody made their choice and we shouldn't be controlling those choices for parents. I'm here representing every parent, every parent here. If you want masks, I'm representing you. I want you to have a choice. If you don't want masks, I'm representing you. I want you to have a choice. We all know what's best for ourselves and our children. Thank you. Thank you. 
Robertson, to Sandy Van Wagner, and Megan Jacoby. Good evening. My name is Brianne Robinson, and I am a Smithville resident. Today, I'm here to request that the Smithville School Board make the decision to make math optional for all students and that you stick to your safe return to in person learning plan that is posted on the Smithville School District's web page. I am the mother of three children, two of which are school aged. I made a promise to those two children that I would enroll them into the Maple Elementary School if it were possible to do so. They are thriving in homeschool, but they miss going to public school and being with their friends daily. When schools went virtually, when schools initially closed in 2020, we endured nine weeks of virtual learning. This type of education did not work for our family. Virtual learning, mandatory mask mandates, and unreasonable quarantine rules made it impossible for my children to attend public school. We decided that homeschooling was the best option. Over the course of the next school year and into the summer, mask mandates have come and went, vaccines have become widely available, and more has been learned about this virus. We have learned that this virus is not and will not be going away anytime soon. We have learned that masking our children has not or will not make this virus go away. Mandatory masking, however, is making it impossible for kids to go back to living a normal life or anything that could be done with them. Mandatory masking is keeping two children out of the Smithville School District. Two children that are very intelligent, caring, and loving kids. Kids that just want to be kids. We left Nashville Elementary School, which is part of North Kansas City School District, and moved into Smithville in hopes that we would have a school board that would listen to the students and parents of the district. Smithville parents can and should be able to make health care decisions for their children without the school board, health department, any other type of government agency to learn how to do so. Let each family make their own decisions. In fact, I know you as a board, you understand this. In your own words, in the safe return to in-person learning plan, it states in the facial covering section that you may decide what is best for your family. So I'm not going to go over statistics or medical reasons why mandatory masks for children are wrong in order to persuade the school. I will, however, plead with you as a mother, a homeschool teacher, and a community member to let parents choose what is best for their kids, let masks be optional, and stick with your safe return to in-person learning plan that you have already put in place for this week. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy Van Wagner, Megan Jacoby, and then Casey Carr. Dr. Schutz, Board of Education, community members. My name is Sandy Van Wagner. I live at 4206 Scottsdale Road, Smithville, Missouri. And I appreciate the opportunity to address you this evening. As I sat down to compose this address, I found myself struggling with many thoughts on how best to convey my message that I wish to deliver. As a society, we've been through a great deal these past 20 months. As we have struggled to cope with the difficulties of COVID-19, and now that school is starting, we have highly transmissible Delta variant to contend with as well. In addition to disease equally challenging are the struggles that we face socially to address the challenges of COVID-19. Our children have suffered alongside us. They have been frightened and grieved along with us through many losses. They have lost loved ones to death from this disease, and they have struggled with their own fears about getting sick. They have suffered in isolation. They have missed school, student to teacher contact, missed their friends, sports, just to list a few. We cannot ask more of them. They have been brave as they have struggled with the shock of suddenly not going to school and feeling the safety and normalcy that that routine delivers. They have struggled with online learning and the support that they needed to be successful. Many children did not have the advantage of a retired and enrolled grandparent nearby to help them navigate kindergarten through high school successfully or were left to their own devices through no fault of their parents or themselves, only a painful result of circumstance. We as a society must now use every tool available to protect our children from more loss. What shall we do? How shall we rise to this challenge? Our solutions for this dilemma are not perfect, but here's what we know to be effective. One, 12 and older can receive the vaccine. Two, 
We can set aside our differences and mask up. We understand this is not a perfect solution, but for now, it is what we have available. Additionally, we have evidence to support the effect of this mask wearing. Three, we can practice social distancing and teach our children to social distance as well. Four, we can practice continued hand washing and sanitizing. Are these things fun? Do we look forward to the discipline required of each of us to do and model these behaviors? No. But are we willing to do everything in our power to protect our children from more losses, from loss of school, friends, sports, family gatherings, and in many cases, tragically, the unnecessary illness and possible death? Think of the tragedy of hospitalization of a child with COVID and COVID ward without mom or dad to comfort them. The fright and terror that they would be subjected to by that experience, even for one child. Just this week, there have been six children under the age of 10 who are currently hospitalized in Springfield, Missouri. For a moment, think about the terror that each of those children have experienced and those parents are experiencing because they're separated. The parents can't be there to comfort them. As parents, we took the time and suffered the annoyance and inconvenience gladly to make sure that our children were secure in seat belts and car seats. And as they got older, we insisted to kind of using the seat belts themselves in the car. Why would we not do the same for them now? Children have been brave. They have grieved and suffered enough. Let's open schools with their needs and safety sharply in focus. Our children need us to step up and care for them, even if it's hard. We need to do what's best for children, for all children. Thank you. Thank you. Megan Jacoby, Casey Carr, and John Shettle. I'm a single resident and I am mama to three beautiful girls, one of whom is a First off, I want to say thank you to the board for holding this working session. I also want to say a big thank you to the teachers, the staff, and the administration for tirelessly promoting this cause for the past year and a half. You are the true heroes in all this. To be honest, I really hope that we were meeting to have this discussion. Um, I think that's something that we can all agree on. Yet, as I stated here, the COVID cases in Missouri are at an all time high, and our area health systems are stressed. Our healthcare workers are begging us to wear our masks and follow infection control guidelines to do our part to keep the spray on the system. Dr. Stephen Sykes, who is the Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Hospital, he tweeted quoted as saying after 12 PMOs, 12 Chief Medical Officers in our metro area met, and he came out of that saying, and I quote, what you are hearing from Chief Medical Officer today is that we need masks and bags. We are not policymakers, but we are healthcare professionals. And we're telling you inside our hospitals and health system, we are at a critical juncture. The numbers are rising rapidly, and there's no end in sight in which we put public health measures in place. There's a book we read in our house with our girls. We need to be It's about a fear that goes out hunting for a bear. We can discuss whether actually taking the bear and hunt for a bear is a good idea another time. But as the story goes, as they're looking for the bear, they encounter all these obstacles, tall grass, mud, et cetera, and so on. And there's this refrain that keeps getting repeated over and over. We can't go under it. We can't go over it. Oh no, we've got to go through it. We can't go around COVID. We can't pretend like it's going away on its own. It is proven this summer that if we let our guard down, it just gets stronger. And personal choice doesn't work either when the choice not to mask or follow guidelines could make another individual sick, a family sick, a classroom sick, causing health strain and financial strain for other people. At the end of the bear hunt story, 
After being chased home by the bear and getting through all the obstacles a second time, the kids run into the room, they pull the covers over their heads, and they say, we are never going on a bear hunt again. Let's defeat the COVID bear so that we don't find ourselves in this same position again next year. We've got to tackle it head on with the tools we know work. Vaccine is age appropriate, putting hand washing, physical distancing, and masks. I'm tired. I think we all are, but it isn't going away. Let's listen to the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Center for Disease Control, and the medical professionals in our health systems that are asking for our help. In my personal experience, the right thing isn't always the easy thing. It takes commitment, it's hard, and yet sometimes it might even make us a little uncomfortable. But we do it, and we go through it together, because it's the best path forward. Let's do our part to ensure our kids can return to school in a safe and healthy manner. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Casey Carr, John Chevalier, and Aaron Nunn. Hello, my name is Casey Carr. I have a soft and one uh, high school medicine. I'm also a healthcare provider. I work in a local hospital and I do work on the front line. This came from a local hospital day. He has cases that are on the rise. Uh, hospital beds are filling up. I hold a master's degree in science, trained in educated research, statistics, peer review, literature review, and scientific analysis. I do understand the science that's behind. The number of the year in the industry. Also, believe there's science and data is not being But that's not why I'm here in my talk. We can talk about the science and take that all day long. I'm here not because I'm a father. Three nights ago, my daughter texted me and said, Dad, there's a school board meeting Thursday night. Will you please go speak on my behalf and express my feelings? Our feelings and and JC, amazing that you were here tonight to speak. That is amazing. <laughs> so let's look at that thinking. My daughter's in high school, summer vacation, and she's asking me to come speak at the school board. I'll be honest with you guys. I've had two daughters go through the system, this school system. I've been to one, maybe two school board meetings, and my daughter's asking me to come speak on her behalf. I'm here to stand up and speak for her. Not just her, but the student body of Smithville, the, the large population of the student body who doesn't want to wear masks more than one. I'm here talking about freedom of choice. I do believe as parents, we have a choice of what we think is best for our children. What are we doing to our children? Our children are hurting because of these mask mandates, staying at home, lockdowns, virtual school. There has been evidence that shows the depression. Anxiety, stress, and mental health issues are on the rise. I mean, look at my own daughter. She does not want to come to school wearing a mask. She is stressed. It's increasing her anxiety level. What are we doing to our kids? Again, let's talk about some reasons why masks actually don't work. Let's don't even talk about science. Let's talk about some examples right here within our own school district. My oldest daughter graduated in the summer of 2020. Summer of 2020, put that off. And I'm so grateful for our high school principal and our superintendent and our staff who worked so hard to make that happen. That meant so much to us. We followed every single guideline, every single mandate that was put in place. It was beautiful. Kids walked in six feet apart, all masked up, spread across the football field, six feet apart. It was wonderful. We complied. What happened as soon as that graduation was over? Those kids swarmed together, hugging, kissing, taking masks off, smiling with her families, taking pictures. That's completely normal behavior. But I look and see that, that happened. Every single bit of ounce of work that went that you guys put forth was out the door like that. Because kids are gonna be kids, and that is normal behavior. I look at our sports teams. We're allowed to take masks off and play sports, contact sports, breathe on each other, sweat on each other, exchange body fluids, fly through the air. 
because they go to school the next day and have to put a mask on. That doesn't make sense. There's no science behind that. I look at our amazing band who has a mask on with a hole in it. We put an instrument in to blow air out through the air. That doesn't make sense. No science. Then I look at my daughter who in the choir. She's on stage singing and required to wear a mask, acting in the beer department. They have to wear a mask, but yet our sports teams don't. They're breathing out. It doesn't make sense. There's no science behind that. That's why mask mandates do not work. You can ignore the science, people. Masks do not work. There's so many inconsistencies that are not following science at all. I am passionate about it. Now, this is my opinion. And I respect everyone's opinion. And that's why we have our freedom of choice. That's what this is all about, people. Not being mandated by our government, local agencies, or school boards. If a student wants to wear a mask, that is great. Respect them, respect each other. If a student doesn't want to, respect them as well. I challenge the Smithville School District and the school board to join the other school districts who have already done so of making wearing a mask optional. Stand up for our children, let our families decide for themselves what's best for our students. Please do not make it mandatory to wear a mask ever again. Thank you for your time to express my opinion and the opinion of my daughter. And thank you for your work. Hey everybody, John Chevalier. Uh, I just want to say I'm all the men here at the city council. So my opinion about the city. Um, I wrote some stuff down, so I don't say anything ridiculous today. So I'll pass. Um, like I guess what one things I, I don't understand is we, we use science to justify um, you know some of the same experts to get our kids back into school in the first. We need to send people to um, help us get our kids back in sports. Now, all of a sudden, we're not listening to them when they say we have masks for our children. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand how we can just ignore uh, the experts right now without using masks. We used them before to just start some of those. So, um, but in, in essence, right, there's, there's, two, there's two rights that are issued. There's a right for the kid to come to school and not wear a mask, and there's a right for the kid to safe education in person. To me, the school board should be more focused on that right of the kid to have an in-person education more than in trying to assuage the feelings of the parents. So that, that's kind of where that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I, I would highly recommend that we have masks, especially for the kids who need the best. And then um, if you do, you guys do allow um, people to be able to do mass. I would highly ask that you choose between the two types of kids. If someone's not wearing a mask, they're vaccinated, they will be wearing a mask after they go home because it's so much. Thank you. 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 Karen Knight, Roxanne Renslaw. First, I was going to have my intervention. First, I wanted to make a comment. A lot of numbers going around. I'm a CEO for Shen Consulting. Um, people hear the numbers of the hospital. They say, oh, look, this percent, this percent. These aren't percentages of patients with terminal in good faith. These are percentages of patients who have tested positive. That means they, they may not have any symptoms. It may not be affecting them whatsoever. They could be in there for a heart transplant. They test positive. I write dashboards for those numbers. I know it's hurting. So don't let those numbers, while they are valid numbers, don't let them move your opinion if you see the facts. And you know, don't let them persuade you too far without understanding what they mean. Um, starting off with the mask, 
Um, the documentation I emailed the school board before I showed up today. Um, I provided you the Dutch study, which is the largest study to date ever done with a control group related to mask in the world. Um, it showed a non statistical difference between positive cases and no positive cases. And people were it. Um, you have to use that information. I also provided you the COVID 19 school response dashboard. Um, that data actually shows it, it compares schools that mask, schools that don't mask. That data is at your hand. You don't need parents here to tell you what to do. You can dig into that data. Um, it shows what are we can debate reasons, but it shows schools that mask had higher positive cases as well as higher rates of serious COVID cases. What, why that is, could be the communities those schools were in, who knows, right? But that's the data we have. It's not an MSNBC or Fox News soundbite up here that's, that's trying to convince somebody their numbers without any meaning behind it. Um, what I also provided is the CDC recently published an article paper, about paper and cloth mask related to smoke particles. This is part of the disaster relief. So if there's a forest fire or something along those lines, um, paper and cloth masks work, they found that they don't work for smoke. Uh, smoke particles are larger than COVID-19 particles. That's not a direct correlation, but just take it for what, for what it is. Oxford academics recently published a study that got this link as well. You guys pull this information up, share it with the community if you'd like. Um, but this, it's not spread from droplets like some people like to say, it's spread from aerosol. Um, mask, paper and cloth masks are not going to stop. Providers wear the cloth or N95s and they go into which are better than the paper and cloth masks that we wear, but that's to stop droplets from coming out of the providers. It's not going to stop them to solve it unless it's sealed and fitted in the new I have one other topic I wanted to talk about. It, it kind of does relate to, to masks with the vaccine. Um, I've heard rumors that certain schools are thinking about implementing a policy that treats vaccinated students differently than unvaccinated. This policy will not go against the data and studies that came from the group that made the decision to so, A lot of issues that come up in one FDA mandated, one state, federal, and local school mandated vaccine to segregate children based off the vaccination status or to quarantine them differently. What the science in the real world is showing us is that the provide there's a lot of issues with the vaccines that we have. Blame the companies who created these, they created them to make money from these things. That's why they were only approved for emergency use. If you need them in an emergency situation, you can use them. But in no way should they spread across the country, even to little kids with no risk for this virus. Pfizer vaccine in the male health system is stated as a 42% effectiveness. Uh, the Israeli government just released 40.5 percent effective in the symptomatic disease. A vaccine needs to have 50 percent effectiveness in order to pass that FDA approval. The UK national statistics report shows what natural immunity a person who previously had COVID and recovered is 6.7 times more likely to not have symptomatic disease or to get it and spread the disease. That's a 607 percent. They're protected 607 percent better than say another parent who happens to have a vaccine for a child. So you're going to send my child home who previously had it and is 670% more protected than another person's child who's vaccinated and at least someone who's more willing to spread that disease. And it makes no logical sense. And it's opening up a lot of legal issues. But trust me, if these are the decisions you guys are important with, this will this will, this is, will not end tonight. I can guarantee you that, okay? Parents are tired of school boards and people pushing their irrational fear on our children, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to do the names up because I don't think that's the time or place to do it. But I see people in this room with masks on right now that I've been sitting at tables with within the last couple of weeks. No masks. I'm not going to do that to people in this forum. Just it's, it's, it's a rational fear pushed by a media that's trying to divide people. The data doesn't back up what we're doing and how we're doing it. So let's start using some common sense. Roxanne Redful and then Tori Francis.
right there. My name is Tori Francis, and I wrote a debate about whether to talk um, back there. But I am a nurse. I work at one of the uh, top COVID hospitals in the city. Um, I've taken care. Has anybody here taken care of COVID patients? Okay, a few of us. So when you take care of COVID patients, um, I'm personally vaccinated. Vaccinated. Vaccinated, I'm a little nervous because I have some health conditions. And if you have health conditions and you are a certain age, you should be vaccinated too. Um, today, tonight. I get the second one. First one's not enough. Um, when you go in to take care of a COVID patient, the only way you can guarantee not to get it is to wear an N95 mask and some goggles. That's the only way. And you can ask any of these nurses back there to take it. We wear these packing machines, and you'll find that most of the nurses aren't even vaccinated. I know of a nurse that was had COVID, got vaccinated with Pfizer, got the second one, got COVID again. And you say, well, that's that's the the uh, the small amount that happened. Well, it's also the small amount of these kids that get COVID and die. Um, in fact, the only thing that I think really that happened with these kids with the mask is we don't have any flu cases. We have no flu cases because everybody's wearing masks and all no flu. There's virtually no flu reported anywhere. And I've worked in the hospital for 20 years, and every year we have this massive influx of flu patients, and it hasn't happened. Um, I'm a father to, uh, I had two kids go through this school. I have eight children, five school children, two biological. Um, I can see where it's taking a toll on the kids. So, I guess to those people who are safe, mask wearers, each one of you got up here and you talked about a mask. And I feel like I've been exposed. And I'm not worried about it. And if you really don't want to get exposed, wear an N95. Wear an N95. And you have that choice. Just like I have a choice, if my place kids fit soccer, I have a choice to get in this brand of. Shin guard or that brand of shin guard. You have a choice in what kind of mask you have. You have a choice to get up here and talk about that. I have a choice to get up here and talk about that. So if you really, really worry about it, get it in 95. Because that's the only thing that's going to keep you. And then you have to change it every four hours. I wear mine all shift, but because they're short. So, anyways, um, that's, I'm a person who's actually taking care of it. And I don't mind myself. Alexis Paul, from the Yeah. Um, I want to first say I've not been yet talking to Nick, but I'm going to do my best to um, express my thoughts and opinions um, as clearly as I can. Um, I do have two children in a single school district. One is a second, will be a second grader at the Big 12 High School, and the other will be a fourth grader at Big 12 Street. Both of them are under the age of 12 and cannot be back. I want to kindly remind each of you that your job and our job as a school is to educate students. It's to ensure that all students have a safe and equitable learning experience. That's our number one priority. All students have a safe and equitable learning experience. That is the job of a public school. And I will assume that each and every single one of us whether we think we should be wearing masks or not, want our students to have the least disrupted school year they can have this year. My own children have, as many children, as many parents, children in this room have been, have been gone to virtual school. My own children were homeschooled half of the year last year and then back in regular school. There's been so much disruption. I think we all can agree we want our children to have an undestructed school year. They each deserve that. This is not about freedom of choice. This is about educating all students in a safe environment and making sure that they can stay in school. My own child has been in ICU twice for asthma. She's been hospitalized six times because of allergies, or asthma-related issues. 
Can you tell me, can you look me in the eye right now and tell me? And you do not require a mask because she will be safe in our school. I don't think you can promise me that. And I do want to see even if everyone does that, it's not guaranteed. But her pediatrician, Dr. Susan Storm, her allergy doctor, Dr. Christopher Miller, both agree that all children should be masked. I cannot imagine a situation where a school board would go against expert medical advice where any of us would potentially place a child like mine and many other in our school in a potentially dangerous situation where we have a solution. If we do not mask, students will be back in line. That's a guaranteed situation. We saw what happened in summer school after just a few weeks. We will once again have students and teachers learning remotely or learning in quarantine. The schools in the South have already began. You can already see what has happened in places like Arkansas, where over 900 students in just the first week of school were placed in quarantine. At the previous board meeting, I heard a board member say that masking is a parental decision. If that's the case, you are choosing the perceived freedom of one group of people while violating the educational liberties of my child. Don't my children have the right to a free and safe public education? Again, that is the goal of any school. By selecting one parent's right to unmask, you are violating the freedoms of my students to attend a school that protects them. You are doing my child and many children in our school to once again be in a school year that is disruptive. No kid should have to go to school in quarantine this year. No kid should have to learn virtually this year. No teacher should have to teach from quarantine this year. We know the solution to that problem. We need to wear masks. Lastly, I know that there is a very um, vocal group against this problem, you know, against masking policy. But please remember, you are here to serve all students by ensuring that all students have access to education. If you do not require masking, you are not providing that service for my child and other high risk children. There's not a virtual option this year. And many kids have already entered months of virtual and quarantine school. It does not physically hurt anyone to wear a mask. But not wearing it could potentially hurt many children in our school. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank everyone who came to speak tonight. Go to our presentation from the administration, code mitigation sheets. Okay, Randy should be pulling up that uh, presentation now. Uh, spent quite a bit of time putting this together for the board, and uh, we'll go through it here this evening with you. And uh, as, as Denny mentioned early in his comments, then the board will have a chance to ask clarifying questions, have a discussion, and we'll come back with a recommendation. So Randy's gonna pull up the first slide here. You would get that in the presentation of these, Randy. Denise has uh, several slides here. Uh, Michelle has a slide. Uh, Kim Davis has a slide. Um, I've got a, a, some comments throughout, and then again, the board will have a chance to uh, to have some discussion. Okay. 
quick in advance. Has a slide. Thank you, Denise. You want to uh, take over from there? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is here. So here, the first bit of data that we grabbed was how many students tested positive during the 2021 20, school year and how many students were quarantined. And so you see there were 191 out of 893 that were tested positive for COVID, and 1,333 out of 893 said that they were quarantined. This was out of the school year last year. I have to remember that some of those students uh, were virtual. So then that's minus all of the virtual kids that were at the virtual. So then that's the one that we're not including those students. During summer school, for one month, the month of June, there, there were 520 students that had been summer school. 22 of those students were positive, so that's 4%. And 206 over 40% were quarantined. But the question had come up how many of those students we believe uh, that were quarantined tested positive, and eight of those students were identified. So that's that's where our little team would have you with the students that were that had were quarantined initially and ended up testing positive shortly thereafter. Um, we did have two contracts for service employees during that time that tested positive. Right, so and uh, we're also in the next video that time. So, so you see a few different between the school year and the summer. So that's the that you can compare those two period. Can you please consider that the school year is hybrid for second years and have population hybrid for seven months? Our school is a winter for one month. Matthew was in the past, but the entire school year up until the last two weeks, and no one has any progress from our school. And students are grouped differently during summer school. So the people who are students at the elementary level during the school year, um, at high school, it's a very similar to our very students during summer school, but during uh, summer school, we'll take each student into groups together from all schools and grade three or eight groups together from all schools. And we can do our mitigation measures in place to start our summer school, which did result in a higher number of quarantines so that they could stay around the levels of mitigation. Social distancing, the whole morning, we're going to have to use the last three weeks or so of several of the last of those cases through our community back into place. The next slide will show you this is a chart that the Pennsylvania Health Center provided for us. As soon as we had a large number of students testing positive, as I said, during the school year, it was really hard to track down which ones of those students were testing positive and maybe quarantined because we had so many factors. And we think people were working, they were kids were sick and they just didn't know where they contracted it. So it was really hard to During the summer school, it was a little more clear that we had so many of those students quarantined and were testing positive. So this is the data they provided on day three. Uh, you, you can see here just the, the, the number, number of students that were testing. That kind of onset and the precipitous case of it ended up coming back. After that, this is the same thing that I can provide. This is what's occurring on our website. You can see that as a community, well, as a community, but as a county, that there are more and more high transmission this time. We ask that they break it down. This is like what we're able to do during the school year, and they're no longer doing that at this time. So this is the method we can give you. You can see here, um, this is from the 5th of, of August, but the data came from the last week of July, and that's what the recent data at the time the presentation was created, and the other data was available. So the new cases were on the rise, the local hospital rates, and then there were hospital presentations within the March. Yeah, yeah, I won't spend much time on this because you're, you're aware of this. You watch the same news uh, that I watch. So uh, around our area, there are multiple uh, mandates and, and lack of mandates uh, as well. Uh, Clay County and Platte County do not have mandates currently uh, in the counties. Uh, Clay County has, as of last night, recommended universal masking in schools. That is a recommendation. 
um, not a mandate. There are mandates in Jackson County, City of Kansas City, North Kansas City. Those school districts in those regions, um, as a result of that, have issued uh, mask mandates. Uh, Platt, or Park Hill School District actually has a meeting, although they're currently universally masked, they have a meeting uh, scheduled for Monday night uh, for public participation. So Platt County School District meets tonight. Uh, so that those are all the things that are going on at Shelter Springs has opted for highly recommended masks for all persons indoors. It's important to know what's going on around us. Um, that That is, um, we need to do our due diligence in that regard. Um, my focus is on Smithville and what's going on in Smithville and what we need to do for our students uh, and staff in this community. Okay, current guidance as we were looking to find out what everyone's recommending from many times tonight by our, by our guests, the CDC, American Academy of Pediatrics, Lake County Public Health Center, and Children's Mercy, as well as the other local hospitals, are recommending universal masking indoors for all schools and staff. That's the current guidance that we provided this morning. So, Trying to figure out what's best for our students, what options are available, we came up with several options. Okay, this, there's three, I believe three screens for this, so bear with me here. The first option would be for universal masking. So all students, PK through 12, as well as staff, would mask indoors only. This is the recommendation from all those entities I just named. With that option, there are several quarantine options we can choose from. One would be no quarantine unless symptomatic. The Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, as well as, the, as well as the Health and Senior Services, think that if a child is exposed in school with a mask mandate, and both the infected and exposed child are directly wearing masks during the exposure, then the exposed child does not have to quarantine at home. The above, uh, not at the working home, the exposed child should monitor for symptoms and isolate if they become ill. Option two, quarantine for 10 days if you have been in close contact, which is identified as three feet, for a cumulative of 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour period with someone who is COVID 19 positive, unless you're fully vaccinated and remain asymptomatic, the Clay County Health Department and CDC. The third option would be the same, but it would be regardless of vaccination status. And the final option that's been passed down by the CDC as well would be quarantine for seven days, as long as you had a negative PCR test on day five or after. You would continue monitoring for symptoms through day 10, and if you don't think you want to keep the PCR test for the quarantine for the 10 days. Option two, would be elementary masking. So students can't be court, um, can't be vaccinated, um, ages 11 and under, then elementary masking. We would combine options two and three, you'll see in just a minute, three would be for secondary students, but for, for the elementary masking option, those, all those quarantine options would remain the same. And then the third option would be masks to be recommended, but it would be a choice for PK through 12. The only difference in that would be the quarantine option at that point. The first quarantine option would be off the table. You would go with quarantine for 10 days if you've been in close contact. But if you're, if you're uh, not vaccinated, you would not have to quarantine or you quarantine regardless of vaccination status for the last one again, which is quarantine for seven days if you choose to get a PCR test. Mitigation measures are important to the staff. We've been talking about masking is a mitigation measure. It's a big one. It's the one that we continue to talk about. The other mitigation measures will continue to be in place. These were in place last year. We'll continue to put them in place this year. We learned that we couldn't take away all layers of protection. So these are the other layers of protection we have in place. Social distancing is recommended. We all know that it's very challenging to socially distance, especially in a high school setting. But it will be recommended and cohorting is encouraged to the best extent possible. 
schools will allow students to eat meals in the cafeteria again. It became a it became very challenging for them to eat out, so we will make sure there are seating charts in place for contact tracing purposes. It would still minimize the number of quarantines and even allowing students to eat there as long as we could contact trace who is around them. In school gatherings such as assemblies, parties, and parent nights should be carefully scheduled to avoid congregations. We still want to avoid large groups of people congregating together. They're calling schools congregate settings, and so we'll try to we do not want to take away all visitors or all access to the school, but we want to keep my school with whatever we are scheduling those. Hygiene hand sanitizer is readily available throughout the school buildings. Students and staff will be encouraged to wash hands frequently throughout the day, having planned breaks uh, before and after meals, recess, switching classes, hand washing and respiratory etiquette will be taught to students. Having healthy facilities, again, cleaning, high touch surfaces will be cleaned and sanitized, as well as um, every classroom will have approved cleaning supplies available. Shared supplies will be limited and discouraged, but they will be cleaned routinely. Contact tracing will continue, just like we have. We'll continue working with the local health department to contact trace to provide information about individuals diagnosed and exposed. We'll also um, strongly recommend and encourage and ask our parents to keep sick children at home. We have to monitor for symptoms. Everyone will have to, so please keep sick children at home, and anyone feeling sick will be sent home. And then testing and vaccinations. Testing sites and vaccination locations and options will be shared. Um, so we'll continue to do our best to communicate and share information that becomes available. I just wanted to share some of the um, learning options for our families. As the board is aware, for several years, we've been required by law to have a virtual learning option should parents and children feel that's the best choice for their students. Up until last year, I can't honestly think of one example where, where a student actually learns completely virtually. Typically, they would take some in-person classes and take some virtual, virtual courses to supplement. Oftentimes, to make their schedule work the way, the way they wanted to or to take the course that we may not offer. Um, in our schools. So this year we will continue with an online learning option. However, it will not be facilitated by our teachers like it was last year. For elementary and middle school, we will utilize Launch, which is the online academy provided by the Springfield Public School District. Those teachers are Missouri certified. The coursework is aligned to the same standards that we use in our district. We feel like that is the best choice for our, our families um, in anticipation for students not remaining virtual and coming back to us in person, and that they would have a more seamless transition back. Um, for high school, we'll use a combination of courses. Of course, we have a few of our own, not anything like we did, um, like we had last year, however. Um, then we will use launch and the new academy for those students um, as well. And there is a fee associated with this um, for an elementary student who attends launch for an entire semester. It's $2,700 per student. Um, middle school and high school, we pay $245 per course per semester that the students are enrolled in. At the end of last year, um, much like our surrounding districts that didn't have a already established robust online program, um, we did not anticipate having much um, demand for these courses, anticipating that um, we would have a better year and that um, our kids would be coming back in person. Um, so there is a significant cost that could be associated with this. Um, and you know, we'll just have to take care of that. Again, by law, we're required to provide this option for our families. Currently, we do not have very many requests for 100% of the law. Um, that last count when I looked at the spreadsheet on which we're tracking, we have these things. Students who have requested um, some elementary, some high school. We do have a policy, policy IGCD, which governs um, how we evaluate whether a student is a good candidate for online learning. 
One thing that we look at are extenuating circumstances, such as health concerns, mental health concerns, health concerns of family members. We would consider COVID in our current situation with the Delta variant to be an extenuating circumstance. We also look at a student's success um, in the classroom and if they've ever had a virtual class before, how did they function in that environment? By policy, we have the right to um, ask a student to return to the person. For example, if a student is not participating at all, which we had some of that last year with our 100% virtual kids, we have some students who um, truly are a year behind because they did very, very little, if anything, in their online classes. Um, due to the circumstances, we um, did not feel that it was right for us to ask the students to come back. Um, with the mitigation measures that we put in place and with vaccination, we feel differently this year, so we are using our policy. Um, so if a student is not successful in the online environment, we can ask them to return. Um, if families are interested in a virtual learning option, they just need to notify their building administrator. Um, we will consider the criteria, and our philosophy really is if a student has shown success, um, we will give them that opportunity to try online learning if that is what their preference is, um, considering their current circumstances. For students who are sick or in quarantine um, during the upcoming school year, um, Jesse has provided us another option for continuing their learning and counting their attendance. Um, as you are aware, in the last few years, we have applied for what's called an AMI plan, and that's an alternate method of instruction plan that we have to go into an extended shutdown. Um, so we submit that every year and have it approved by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, our plan includes many different ways to deliver instruction to our students, including using Google Classroom, videos that teachers may create or um, that they have acquired online or from colleagues. Um, it could include um, remoting into a class. There are a lot of options that we can use. Um, and definitely allowing us to use that plan with individual students as we did throughout the school year and still count their attendance um, toward our ADA. So that is our plan for um, to use our AMI plan and all the options available to our students. Who are quarantined or sick during the school year. Okay. okay. Is it on? We didn't turn it off. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit to talk about COVID leave for our staff members. Um, last year when COVID came about, um, we needed something in place to take care of staff that would be um, out of the office, off campus, out of the classroom due to either illness or quarantine or to care for a family member. That was through the Family First Act and all schools implemented that. That act sunsetted in December of 2021. We went ahead 2020. In January, we decided to continue to provide our staff with leave um, related to COVID. We ended that at the end of June of this year. We thought we would need um, additional COVID leave for our staff, but as we've seen with the COVID numbers ramping up and everything that surrounds COVID, we do need to plan um, how we're gonna handle that for our staff for this year. Last year under the Family First Act, there was a lot of liberal application to how that leave looked. And we really wanted to make sure that we were taking care of our staff. We again want to make sure that we're providing our staff with the ability to take leave associated with COVID that isn't going to directly impact their personal accrued leave because of the circumstances surrounding quarantines and the situation in the school. So what we would like to do, not changing our current policies, but rather um, provide consideration for a resolution to add some additional COVID leave again this year. It would look different than last year's leave. We would like to propose up to five days of leave for our staff. It would cap at five days of leave. Anything beyond five days related to COVID would then have to fall on the staff's personal accrued leave. 
um, if they don't have any accrued leave left in their bank, then that would fall to dock date. Um, we would want the leave to also be applicable if they needed to take care of a family member, um, a child or spouse in their home. This leave would not apply for um, to our substitutes in the building, and it would not carry over into summer school. It would um, end at the end of the school year. Um, if you have any questions on leave for our staff, we can discuss that. Um, as time for questions and discussion. Can you back up one more time, please? Can you just go back to the last slide one more time, please. You want to go back to the COVID leave? Yeah. Okay. Right. So if you recall from last year under the Family First staff, we provided 10 COVID leave days and it could be for a number of reasons. It could be if they needed to care for a family member. Or it could be if they were ill themselves. It could be if they had to quarantine. As we began to get better um, in that environment, we really learned how to teach virtually and utilize telework. And so we're hoping that this is gonna be more of a safety net. And so reducing that number to five days of leave rather than 10, we think will be manageable. And it also will all depend upon those mitigation measures that we put in place. There are surrounding school districts who have decided to go with no additional leave. And then we have others who were being um, utilizing leave a little similar to what was utilized last year. Um, so we are kind of trying to fall somewhere in the middle. We want to make sure our staff have a safety net to fall back on. And so that's why we went with five days of leave. Okay, this is the time the presentation has completed. It's time for board members to ask questions, make comments. Uh, I'm not going to go down the list and Call anybody so if you have any questions or any comments, uh, please at this time proceed. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and comment here. Yeah. Uh, I've got a statement to read. Uh, uh, for, uh, first and foremost, I think uh, uh, I want to thank everyone who came and spoke this evening. Greatly appreciate you attending and being part of this process. This is undoubtedly one of the more difficult decisions. And technical issues. Let's try this one. This is undoubtedly one of the more difficult decisions facing school boards. The, the debate on this topic has our nation so divided that we can no longer have a civil discussion and instead have turned to personal attacks and questions of the science and facts used by the other side. Let's be clear, we're all in this to protect and educate our children. And I wanna share my thoughts on this topic. Um, I'm gonna lean a little bit harder on this one than I have in any other topic that we've talked about during my time on the board. For those of you who don't know, I have a degree, uh, a master's in health administration degree, and I serve as a healthcare executive with responsibility for over 300 providers across the Kansas City area uh, at multiple hospitals. I live COVID and COVID protocols day in and day out and don't rely on uh, the news or Facebook posts to tell me what's going on. Those of you who also know me know that I largely oppose mandates. Um, I believe that uh, federalism is the best uh, source of, of government and that government of the people and by the people is best. And any of you can stop any one of us in Price Chopper. Many of you, I talked to you today at Price Chopper. You can email us, you can call us, and you can stop and talk to us and share your opinion and your opinion matters. That's why I believe these decisions are best made at the local level. I've also shared from the start that I believe that COVID virus is very real and extremely dangerous and that each family should inform themselves of their risk factors and make decisions for their family and well-being based on their specific instances. As for me and my child, the risks are real and we've both been fully vaccinated. I've also shared that I will make my decisions here based on local data and what is occurring in our Kansas City metro community, including the numbers of cases, the spread of cases and the vaccination rate. So let's talk about those local risk factors. 
as we look at that, I'd look at four different areas to consider. One is the risk of personal illness, which can be very high or very low, depending on your age and, and health. Second is, uh, similarly, there's the risk of infecting others. Third, there's the societal level. Um, a pandemic can overwhelm hospitals and supply chains, making them effectively unavailable to treat other conditions. Think of heart attacks, pneumonia, trauma, things that need to get into the hospitals. Think of the swamped hospitals that we saw in New York City at the pan pandemic's peak. Then there's our societal response to the pandemic that can create a risk to schools, businesses, mental health, and potentially to both the political and economic stability. From the personal risk perspective and thinking about that and the, the COVID vaccine uptake, our individual perceptions are certainly driving force. Some 85% of Americans over the age of 65 are vaccinated against COVID-19. This reflects their correct assumption about the COVID-19 risks high for their age group versus our understanding of the vaccine risk uh, very low compared to their COVID-19 risk. Conversely, only about 40% of those ages 12 to 18 are fully vaccinated. This is partly due to the timing of the vaccine eligibility for this age group and also reflects their personal risk of severe COVID-19. That risk is much lower for children. On the societal risk side, we must consider that roughly 920,000 US hospital beds we can better understand the societal risks understanding that. Most of the time, U.S. hospital beds are three quarters full, leaving a surplus of about 200,000 beds at any given moment. Our country has a population of 328 million. If only six in every 10,000 citizens need a bed tomorrow, it would swamp the U.S. health care system. For perspective, the risk of a 65-year-old being hospitalized due to COVID-19 is 122 to 10,000. This explains the concerns that rose across the spring of 2020 as U.S. hospitals filled up, our governments closed the economy and paused elective surgeries to reduce the likelihood of overwhelming our hospitals. While a limited number of people witness the effects of the full hospitals, everyone sees the effects of the economic shutdown. Both of the risks are present and it's difficult to balance them. Economic shutdowns and mass masking looms large at this current COVID-19 surge continues and a new variant emerges. At this point, we all grapple with the personal risk of COVID-19 as well as the risk to our families and communities. We can rest assured that there is a long positive history of good results from vaccination and the COVID-19 vaccines have been very low risk profile compared to most of our other personal risks and our societal risks. If you're vaccinated, thank you. I'm also vaccinated due to my risk assessment. Please give strong consideration of receiving the vaccine if you've not done so already. Vaccines are how we will end this pandemic. The COVID-19 vaccines are well studied and Delaying vaccination is most certainly a miscalculation of one's personal risk. The risk of personal illness in the Kansas City Metro is what I wanna look at next. We saw 1,400 new cases Saturday and 185 new hospitalizations yesterday. Those numbers are on par with our peaks from last, last winter and we're still weeks away from the expected peak in, in current of this current surge. The healthcare system I work for has 863 beds in the Kansas City area. Today, there are 22 of those beds available. That is where I have a problem. The risk of infecting others is much higher with this Delta variant. And while the problem of vaccinated individuals being hospitalized is low, the likelihood of being infected and passing it on is higher as we have seen with several high profile cases in the Metro. The risk is overwhelming the healthcare system is a great concern. I'm living this every day and see the realities that forced our area chief medical officers to join a call for proactive attempts to save the healthcare system by asking schools to mask their students and staff. We're at the tipping point of overwhelming our healthcare system. Finally, the societal risk to our economic well being are high. And if we have another shutdown that crippled so many businesses, I don't know how many of them are going to be able to come back. For those reasons above, I believe that we need to uh, give criteria to our administration to allow them to provide the appropriate level of protection for our students and staff based on the guidance from uh, the CDC and the Clay County Health Department. This should start with masking all individuals in our school and allowing Dr. Schutz to move to a stage two that would allow us uh, vaccinated individuals the choice of whether to wear a mask and then subsequent stages, including returning to the choice for each family based on their own risk factors without having to wait for the board to vote and meet every time to move to the next step. While I generally oppose mandates, I believe that we're at a moment that requires us to amend the social contract and protect not only our personal health, but the overall society well-being of our students, staff, family, and the businesses that support our great communities.
I'm, I'm sorry, but we invite everybody here to respectfully, and I understand your passion and your compassion, but we sit here and listen to everybody's comments, and not one person did that. So let's be respectful of everybody's comments. I'm not pointing fingers, okay? I'm asking okay, everybody to be respectful. Next week. Next week. I will. Next, anybody else at the end of the end? Make sure I'm off mute. So, I mean, I, I got to be honest, guys. Um, I wrote two different statements coming into this meeting and heard an account, I think, from everybody, not just including in this room, but all week from several people. And thank you for that input. And there's several things that stick out to me. You know, my background, for a lot of you who don't know, I worked in public health. I've investigated disease outbreaks. I was around during H1N1. I was around to support Ebola from an emergency preparedness standpoint. I worked for Mid-America Regional Council as the emergency health and medical program manager for the entire metro area in terms of time critical diagnosis and referral patterns. So when I say I'm a fundamentally against the mandate, I have to weigh that into several concessions and considerations. Like some of you have stated, I, I too have issues with inconsistencies in terms of who we put a mask on and who we don't when a mask is required in an educational setting and when it's not. I believe all school supported activities, if we feel it's this, if it's this necessary to protect our imminent health and safety, I believe all aspects of what school support should consider a mask, not one or the other. So I, I too have issues with that and the philosophy behind that. Um, you know, the inconsistencies and the realities that some of you have spoken to that your community and your children have the option to be masked in school, but directly go over to their friend's house, hug it out and have a good time, mitigates and negates all the energy and efforts put in by the school board and the school district and the administration conceptually with what we're trying to do. I have issues with that. There's inconsistencies there. So the pre-notion that we are doing good by putting this in place, given the community circumstance, I think is a valid point. And it, it gives me pause and it makes it very hard for me to have this conversation and tell you which way I'm gonna lean. The other things I'd like to acknowledge, I read an email this week from a middle school kid who was vaccinated, who is immunocompromised and has several risk factor challenges and has not been to school in over a year and a half. And then I think about how do you, and this is, I, I'm taking you guys through my thought process because I want you to see not just one perspective we have to look at, but both. But this individual student has yet to be at school and without a mask mandate, will not be able to attend school and see their children. I once asked a child who I, who I hold very dear in my life, and I said, what do you think of masks? He goes, it sucks, I hate it, okay? What do you think of masks if it allows your buddy who you haven't seen who has adverse health effects? If I said, unhealthy, if they have the opportunity to come see you. And he goes, I said, would you wear a mask? He goes, Glad, Dad, I'd be happy to wear a mask to see my friend and play with him if, that was, if that's what it took. So there's a perspective there of a young child. Um, I also work at a large health system and I've seen the impact of what that's done to our health system, not only on me, but operationally in our bed count. And I don't think there's any way where I'll land with you guys that will make you happy, but here's, here's what I feel and this is where I stand. The fact that I see very little downside to putting a mask on and a lot of preventative considerations, regardless of the merit of the science behind them or not, which I am not an expert in, I will not pretend to be, so I will lean on people who are experts in that opinion. Um, and based on the recommendations of the administration, I will support a mask mandate, regardless if I feel it's, it's uh, institutionally accessible or not. That's where I stand. Uh, it's on. No. Push up. Turn your mic off on you for your Zoom.
There you go. All right. <clears throat> I ran for school board on the notion that I believe that uh, members of school board ought to have kids in the district because that makes the decisions that they make uh, have skin in the game. It's not to say that people that don't have children in the district can't do a good job. I just believe that those, those folks on the school board making the decision ought to have kids in the district. I have kids in the district. I have two kids in the district. Um, does any decision made tonight affects me, affects my family, affects my kids, affects my kids' as friends, it affects their families, it affects those in my church, it affects their families, it affects this community. So any decision made here tonight is made not in, in, um, not in short order. Lots of thought has been put into it. It does affect me and my family, just like it affects everybody else. Um, <clears throat> no matter what the outcome tonight, there's going to be half the people in those groups that I just mentioned that are going to be upset. There's going to be half the people in this room that are going to be upset. There's going to be half of our community that's going to be upset and believe we've made the wrong decision. Whatever decision is made tonight, both sides needs to have grace with the other side and realize we're all doing what we believe is in the best interest of ourselves, our students, and the kids in this school. So though I have a different opinion than most, or I have a different opinion than others, that doesn't mean that their opinion is wrong. It doesn't mean they're mean and evil people. We need to realize that a difference of opinions are just that. And we were all elected to give our opinion and, get, and weigh in on how we feel. So having said that, I have had the luxury of having time the last five to six days of sitting down and actually doing as much research on this topic as I possibly can. I am not a medical expert. I am an engineer by education, by trade. Uh, so the in, most of my readings, I read the emails that were sent to me, every last one of them, and did research on a topic. I try to focus on medical professional uh, um, publications to avoid any political or media influence on the things that I read. Uh, and this is what I found. I found that in, in expert medical research, the opinions are on both ends of all things COVID. You can find opinions both for and against vaccinations. You can find opinions both for and against the, uh, supporting and uh, discounting the infection rates and what they say. You can find medical opinions against and for wearing masks. Some of the consistent information that I did find is the symptoms are much more intense with COVID-19 than they are for influenza. The rate of transmission exceeds that of regular influenza. Going back to the masks, medical experts, some are calling for masks, while other experts are questioning their effectiveness. The ones that I read that question the effectiveness all came from the Journal of American Medical or Journal for American um, Medical Association, J A M A. Um, they have lots of articles. You can all go out and read them. Uh, it's hard, hard searching, but they're out there. Um, we find ourselves in a, uh, in a position now where medical experts are without definitive solutions. We throw in our political climate and the media circus. It becomes impossible for any of us to get any real information on what, what's, what's going on especially to try to make a good course of action. If this were not the case, then there would not be such passionate comments here tonight. The very fact that we have some passionate comments and people are, are frustrated and upset on both ends shows that, that the information out there is unclear. So where does that leave us? No matter what decisions made, again, grace needs to be offered. Um, I, for one, <clears throat> have a difficulty with the mask mandates when the information that I read is unclear, the evidence, whether they actually work or not. <laughs> That's not to say that the other side doesn't have some good, good points to make as well, but 
the evidence of wearing a mask alone, whether it stops the transmission or reduces the curve is unclear. And that is, that's the information that I found. That's the information that's presented in the JAMA. Uh, there are both articles and that magazine that supports both sides. So yes, a person could email me with a, with a study represented by JMA, JAMA that says the opposite. I'm just telling you what I saw. And what I've found out is that, or what I've read, is that there is some inconclusive evidence whether masks are even effective. And if that's the case, I have a hard time standing up and saying we're going to mandate masks in a situation where medical professionals disagree on whether they're, they're effective or not. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming today, and I want to thank everybody that has emailed me, um, contacted me. Um, you know, I think sometimes we might look on Facebook, and I look on Facebook, but I don't get my answers from the community from Facebook. I look at it because I think that is a place where sometimes people can say things maybe they don't, or, or be very passionate and not have anything behind it, but... What I've went on for part of my data is um, parents. I mean, I have got uh, almost over 100 emails from parents, from teachers, from kids. Um, and I have to say that there is both sides. But what I have seen is about 70% of those would like to have masks. Um, so that's part of my data that I have gathered that I personally um, have looked at. Um, and then what I look at too is, I, I agree with everybody, I'm not an expert. I work in the medical field. I wear masks every day. I wear them eight hours a day. Um, do I like it? No. But do I do it? Yes. Because I work for patients that have immune compromised. Um, they have ALS and they have, um, I work for hospice. So these patients, if I accidentally gave them COVID, it would speed up a death that is already coming anyway. So, um, but I'm not an expert. So what I have to do is look at the experts that I consider experts. That would be the ones, the CDC, the um, everybody, the, uh, the APA, everybody that's recommend that kids should wear a mask. And I know there's a lot of people out there that say, you know, everybody's, there's many people that have sent me emails and data that's said that they're wrong. But what I have to do is look at what I have studied. I've been a dietitian for 20 years. I've been in the medical field for 25. And I have followed their recommendations even before I ever become, became a board member or anything. So I have to stand on their recommendations. And I want to keep our kids in school. Uh, my kids can't, my kids can't do it again where we did hybrid. Um, I've heard from many teachers, many teachers said, do we really want to wear masks? No, but if it means my kids are in the classroom, they're not quarantined, I can actually teach and do my job, then I'm willing to wear a mask. Um, so that says a lot for me. So just where you know where I'm coming from, and that's what I think. All right, I'm going to keep this brief because most of you touched on everything that um, I was going to say. Susan, oh my gosh, all the emails we've received this week from parents, teachers, text messages, soccer practice, everywhere I've been, someone's had a comment about this. And I know there are a lot of people here vocal for no masking, but there are just as many, if not more people, very vocal and very passionate about masking. Um, what I've learned tonight, the data is inconsistent. I think it more supports masking. That's my own opinion. I think people are gonna choose what they want to believe. And 
that's their choice. They can choose whatever they want to believe, you know, right or wrong. So I'm going to choose to say that, yes, masking is what it's going to take to get our kids back in school and hopefully keep our kids in schools consistently. Um, I have three boys in the district. They're all three very active boys. I asked them the other day. I was, I didn't, I don't have a statement ready because I still was so unclear, you know, reading every single email. I couldn't respond to all of them. I responded to some of them. And yesterday I just asked my boys, I'm like, are you guys gonna be mad at me if I vote to mask you guys, you know, the school year? And they're like, no, mom, we just wanna go to school. So I know there are gonna be kids who are gonna be upset, but I think there are gonna be more kids who are just gonna be happy to be in school. And I think teachers are gonna be happy to be able to teach this year. So um, I would totally support universal masking starting off the school year and then taking a look at it again um, in October. That gives us what, almost a full quarter. Um, again, I know it's not gonna be popular for everyone, but I really think that we need to um, err on the side of caution. I agree with everybody up here that we've been just inundated with information and personal opinions about this masking thing. Um, I realized thinking last night, and I have stayed awake at night rolling this over in my brain, that I watch approximately, watch, listen, or read approximately four hours of news a day. Now, it drives my wife nuts, but I just am converged with all these opinions, and I, I recognize them as opinions because there's one uh, there's one pediatrician says that masks work, and then I listened to a, a half hour uh, broadcast of another pediatrician that gave the statistics on why masks don't work and why we're not handling this virus the way we should be handling it. For every six you hear that are for it, you hear six that are against it. And that might change next week. But I think it goes beyond that for me, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond, do I have the right to tell you how to send your kid to school? I have, I have the right to make the school safe, but I shouldn't have to tell you to put a mask on your child. If I had a child in school right now, I would probably tell him or her to wear a mask. My daughter, who is a student at Northwest, has a compromised immune system, works at Applebee's. Applebee's policy is you have the mask on when you go through the door, and then when I set you at the table, you can take the mask off. That doesn't make any sense. You are more exposed at the table to more people than you are at the door where there's only you and her. To me, putting a mask mandate on is like running to the sand and sticking our head in it every time somebody hollers fire. We need to work more and do more research to figure out how to, how to get through this. I heard a doctor say uh, a couple months ago that COVID is here, we need to figure out how to live with it and go from there. But I'm not gonna tell you how to send your kids to school. That is not, that does not make me feel good. Denise, what does the data suggest if I come to school and I have a mask on, but another student doesn't in terms of quarantine guidelines? Does it state you have to have both masks on to mitigate quarantine guidelines? One, just recommend it, right? So right now, from what I can, from the information.
information I gave you, you know, the, the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the Health and Senior Services, both say, you know, they're both masks and there's no quarantine needed. The CDC and, and Public Health Center say if one person's fully vaccinated, they don't have to quarantine. So it, it just depends. So there's nothing about one mask. So if I sent my kid in school to mask, I would mitigate his quarantine risk. So right now, I mean, the option would be, would be the seven days and a, and a negative PCR test at day five. And then if, it, if day five or after, then they could come back. But if, if one person's mask, I mean, it's unclear. I don't have an answer. There's, there's nothing that I've read that said if one student is masked and the other's not. I could go through my pages of That's all right. I was just trying to understand operational impact to the educational environment. Thank you. Thank you. Just for that, though, um, I, mean, I can only imagine what a nightmare it would be for if I did. Um, what a nightmare it would be for staff. We're going to have our staff and our administrators spending their whole days mitigating did this kid have a mask on? Did that kid have a mask on? Okay, sorry. I'm not very tech. I'm I'm just thinking of the if we if we said if one kid had a mask on and the other didn't, what a nightmare that is for would be for our school system, for our teachers, for our administrators, um, quarantines and guidelines. Um, we're gonna be spending all of our time on where is one kid sitting, where's the other. Then I know people will say well, they then just get rid of the whole quarantine. Well, Again, it goes back to my thought of I'm getting these recommendations from these experts, and they're all saying there should be some kind of quarantine. So I, I personally can't say we just get rid of all quarantines. So I think a couple purposes of tonight. One was to kind of let our parents know where we were headed as a board and what this decision was going to look like from a masking perspective. The other is a realization that a lot of the local data and recommendations have come out just recently. What I'd love to see us tonight is vote for how we're going to handle masking going forward and then ask the administration to put together a, a recommendation on some sort of gating criteria that as data comes down, the removing of masks and at the same time allow them to come up and look at a proper quarantine policy because I, I believe that that's probably more important than even the masking on how often are we quarantined, what are we quarantining for, and a lot of those recommendations have just come out. That's something I'd like to see us as we kind of take our next steps with this, and I certainly don't want to revisit this every meeting, but believe that there's so much data that's come out recently in recommendations that we probably don't have that ready to go. Um, handle the extracurricular activities. Um, you know, it's a school supported function. We're, we're requiring mask, leaning towards requiring mask in the classroom. What's the evolution of what that looks like to the extracurricular events? And then, you know, because if you argue to me, it's out of a safety perspective for all, you know, the inconsistency there, I'm still stuck on a little bit. What is that process? Please. I wish we were, I wish we had guidance on that right now. I want to go back. I was thinking about Susan's question, like if one person's mask, the one is not. You know, you know, all of the guidance we've been given right now is for everybody to be masked. So I can't answer it because there's no guidance with one person or not. So that makes it challenging. But to go to go to your question right now, um, the guidance we've been given is for indoor masking only. So that leaves outdoors unmasked. That means recess would be unmasked and means activities outside. Uh, unless Dr. Schutz knows, I'm not aware of any guidance right now for activities yet. So fall sports, the health department did meet, they have their meeting. I'm not sure if we have a call every Friday, so they may be giving you some guidance tomorrow. But at this time, you've not been given any clear guidance to extracurricular activities. The Clay County Health Department provided um, in, their in their discussion, discussion and, and we have their draft document before their meeting last night. 
but we do not have the document at the conclusion of their meeting last night. But we know from their meeting that they discussed very clearly that they recommended for indoor sports that there would be masking. Uh, for outdoor sports, um, from what I can understand from the conversation, that masking was not a consideration. You know, when we went into last school year, um, we were not getting guidance that suggested we needed to mask our athletes because of the, the risk involved there of physical exertion uh, during the activity could create actually more risk. Football, you cannot wear a mask in football. It's not allowed. Uh, it's a hazard, you know, to wear a mask in football. So it was quite a discussion last year and we did, we, volleyball did mask last school year. Um, the other sports did not. Um, we did not have a lot of spread um, throughout our, our sports uh, last fall. As Denise is, is mentioning, the guidance that's coming out to us now from these organizations is not zeroing in on or focusing in on uh, sports extracurricular activities. These are the hot spots. These are the things that you need to mitigate. Uh, sports is, is not something that's talked about. Actually, until last night, uh, the Clay County Health Department is the first discussion I've heard about all of this. Having said that, um, I think it prompts a deeper conversation uh, and deeper investigation from the administration regarding that. I think some valid points were made. That is our local county health department uh, telling us to look at indoor sports and um, those athletes that are participating in indoor sports being math. So, Mr. Schaefer and I have spoken a couple of times already since that meeting last night, and we will do our due diligence and, and flush this out and determine what we think is best for really we're just talking about volleyball at this point in time. I'm sure I just looked up the guidance and the draft guidance, it, it really does not say, it says that coaches and school sports administrators should also consider sports related risks. It just lists the risks, but it doesn't give you any guidance at this time. So yeah, we don't have that, um, the copy that was adopted by the health board last night. We don't have that in our hands. Uh, when we do, that will uh, give us a much better opportunity to, to flush out those questions and, and provide direction uh, to Coach Schaefer and, and all of our fall coaches. Be lying to you guys, but I'm still not up to my head what I want to do. Um, because I think about recommendations, and I, I think about the recommendation from our local public health agency last fall to move sports to the spring, and we move forward with fall sports. I think about, so we, we chose which recommendation we want to follow at the time, but then I also think it's important to note the consideration of the operational impact it will have on education if our quarantine guidelines without masks. So now I'm, I'm thinking not so much safety, but now I'm thinking operational and what that would do to the classroom environment because we don't have, if we don't have any guidance that says, if I can protect myself and mitigate my risk of quarantine by just putting a mask on, I do that effectively. But since that doesn't exist operationally, we impact the classroom by potentially sending so many kids to quarantine. And I get, I get the comments that I heard, well, that can be changed, but data each way, right? Where does our risk lie? How do we assess that? Where do we lean and what do we work with? Anyway, my thoughts, I don't know. Thank you, Denny, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I just had a couple of things to add. Over the past two days, I've heard from, from three former board members. <laughs> First question that I ask each one of them is they want to trade seats tonight. They all politely declined. <laughs> but the first thing and the most important thing they all said is that the board is here to provide a safe environment for children's education. That is the utmost responsibility of the board. 
And as we go over the last three weeks, I'm not sure if there's anybody in this room that at some point or another didn't watch the Tokyo Olympics and watches each of the fastest and the strongest and the biggest athletes of the world participating. And each time they stepped off the track or out of the pool or off the court, there was a mask waiting for them. And they did it. Whether they wanted to or not, I did, I did read a few things about uh, certain athletes that, that went against the, the mass communities, that is Tokyo, but it still was very visible and out there for the world to see. Uh, like everyone said, I have read every email. Uh, sorry, I was not able to respond to every email. It was literally hundreds of emails that came in over the past two weeks. And when I say hundreds, I mean hundreds. Uh, there was one email that came in today that I would like to, to mention uh, and hand out or mention my heartfelt condolences uh, to the lady that sent this email who just lost her father from COVID. And that was a very touching, very touching email, regardless of the age or anything else. So, uh, my condolences do go out to her. We talked about the experts. Uh, I, I listened to my local physician. I have seen several physicians and nurses, many children's mercy experts. I did watch the uh, board, the chairman of the board, or the CEOs of all the hospitals, and their presentation on masking. And everything that I have seen and that I've heard locally has recommended masking. And the last thing that I would add was I, uh, I was talking with a young lady last Friday who's pretty close to me personally, um, has worked for the last 20 months in an ICU unit, firsthand, day in and day out. And this past summer, she decided to uh, help fund the vacation. She decided to help out as a substitute in a nurse in one of our summer school programs. And was there in school one day and was helping a, a kindergarten student who eventually tested positive for COVID. And this ICU nurse who was in our elementary school two days later, tested positive for COVID, had just two weeks of work. And that just kind of hit me, you know, hit me real hard that, uh, you know, 20 months of masking up and suiting up and being there on the front lines. And she stepped into a, to an environment, just, you know, turned some extra money and ended up testing positive for COVID. That, that just kind of hit, hit it home. So, I do appreciate everybody coming out tonight. I do appreciate the opinions. I do appreciate the emails. Like Scott said, uh, you know, we are we are still from the Smithville community, and we're going to get it through this regardless of how this goes, whether one side likes it or not. And uh, hopefully, as we progress and as we vote on this here in just a couple of minutes after we hear the recommendation. That, uh, that we move forward. Everybody wants things back to normal. Well, the one thing I can guarantee you is we are not back to normal. There is no normalcy yet in our society. And that's just a fact. That's the one fact that I can state. When will we be normal again? I don't know. Nobody knows. But at this time, if no, none of the other board members have any questions or thoughts to share uh, about the presentation, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Schutz, and he will provide a recommendation for how the district uh, wants to proceed. Yes, Randy, if you could pull the PowerPoint back up to the blank slide, if you would, please. And uh, while Randy does that, just a couple of comments real quick I, I'd like to make if I could. Um, I've been pretty quiet so far this evening and that's been intentional. Uh, I wanna thank the colleagues uh, that I have in the central office and, and all of their 
hard, hard work. Um, we are all COVID all the time. Um, that's what we do. And um, it's what the job calls for right now. And that, that's okay. I mean, we, we signed up for whatever our kids need, whatever our staff needs, uh, we're gonna work hard to see that we, we get the job done. So it's been consuming a lot of our time. And so you heard from several of our resident experts tonight, uh, if you will, as it relates to this topic. Um, so, Randy, do we have the presentation up here? Uh, at least this, there we go. Here it comes. Go back to the blank slide, please. Uh, right before that. So, I received my credentials uh, to be a superintendent uh, about 16 years ago. Uh, there, there was darn it, no there's no classes on epidemiology, and, uh, and there was no. Um, on how to become an infectious disease doctor. I have a son-in-law in medical school. Medical school. Uh, he's not headed towards infectious disease uh, as a specialty. It would be really handy uh, if he would, that that would have somebody to lean on. I don't, I don't have that expertise, obviously. Uh, I thought Scott said earlier after all of his research that he, he does feel like a medical expert. He was actually saying that he does not. And so I don't chuckle over here because I thought he said, I'm now a medical expert. We're not, uh, we're doing the best we can. And so I thank my colleagues here for all of their work and preparation uh, for this meeting and every single day, all the hard work and study and, and turmoil and, and uh, that we put into uh, trying to do the best job we can for your kids. And then I wanna thank our, our school board here. Um, you heard from all of them, and uh, very, very heartfelt content, uh, comments. As you can tell, they have not taken this lightly. Um, they have thought a lot about um, this issue and what they feel is best. So um, I'll go ahead and, and stop there um, and, and jump into the presentation. Uh, there's probably not more that I can say that it hasn't already been said. So Randy, let's jump into the recommendation, if we would, please. So we know that COVID's present in the community. You really can't argue it's here, right? Um, we know that our youth are contracting this Delta variant at greater rates uh, than the previous strain. Uh, you could try to argue that, I suppose, but it seems pretty evident that that's what's taking place. We know that in-school transmission rates were very low last school year. We know that. We're talking about action research. We know that. That was the case last year. We know that we had an outbreak in summer school without masks. Fact, we had an outbreak in summer school. We did not have masks on. So that's Smithville, Missouri. That's not what's going on in Clay County. That's not what's going on in Kansas City, the state of Missouri. We had an outbreak in summer school in Smithville. We didn't have masks on. We were doing so well through the school year until we took the masks off and we had summer school. It is well researched that two years of less than adequate instruction create a significant gap in learning. There's a lot of researchers that have, have studied this over and over and over. Um, quick Google search and, and you'll see lots and lots of articles. With the shutdown of 2020, we did the best we could. And we didn't do too bad with the cards that we were dealt. Very, very proud of our staff and the instruction that was provided virtually in the spring of 2020. Uh, very, very proud of our people and our kids and, and the efforts that they made by and large. Last year, again, hybrid for our secondary students, did the best we could. There were some benefits to that some students found and shared with us and teachers as well. That's not what we want for our students. We want our students to be with us under our roof every day so that we have the best opportunity to have a personal relationship with them, to be a, an adult role model for each and every kid. That's what, that's what I signed up for, to have the opportunity to make a difference in the life of a kid. That's hard to do over a computer screen. We need our kids in school. Uh, that gives us the best opportunity to have a meaningful and impactful education with our kids. 
So some level of quarantine, and, and it's, my statement here says many agree that some level of quarantine, I have no idea how many people would agree with the statement, but some level of quarantine is appropriate if you're exposed to this virus. We know it's here, we know it's spreading. If you're exposed to it, there needs to be some kind of quarantine. Again, that's you, you can agree or disagree with that, um, that statement. And, and current guidance provides for no quarantine if both parties are wearing a mask. No quarantine necessary. Randy, next slide. So as such, I recommend universal masking uh, to the board uh, for all students and staff while indoors, because I believe this provides the best opportunity to keep our staff in school uh, and limiting quarantines. This may not this may not eliminate quarantines, right? There are times our students uh, you got to take your mask off to eat. Um, there are some recess considerations, and we have some administrative minutia to work through in our reentry plan. Uh, but there could be some times uh, that a mask is taken off if, if we if if you adopt universal masking. Um, so, so we have some, some issues to work through there. So elimination, I'm not talking about, but we'll be drastically eliminating, drastically reducing uh, quarantines. Uh, as has been stated, uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, the October board meeting is an opportunity to review this. Uh, it is important, and we've had board members suggest that, Todd, we've got to have some kind of metric. Um, what are we going to use to... Um, to identify here, what's the trigger to say, okay, things are much better. We got to do something now. Uh, let's back off of this mass thing and move forward. So the best data that we have at this point is the community transmission uh, data that's provided by Clay County. As Denise mentioned, as Hartwood mentioned, uh, we used to have 64089 data and we can plug that into the gating criteria. We don't have that right now. Uh, the best we have is the um, is the county data. So right now we're in the red. Um, what has been suggested is that um, orange is the next level down, that we need to be in yellow. Uh, and I would suggest yellow for three weeks um, straight before we begin to talk about reducing um, the masking requirement. That is minutia, that is, that is a debatable, that's something that is a board. Uh, you can tell me, Todd, that's too much. We need to talk about that or that you support that, what have you. Um, the important thing is that tonight, our public and our staff need to know what the direction is on masking. Um, and, and, and that falls on the school board. There is legislation um, that would actually dictate, um, if we're understanding that correctly, it's still being um, sorted through by lawyers, but is something that the board uh, would need to vote on eventually anyway. So I ask you tonight, board, um, to adopt a universal masking procedure for all students and staff while indoors and outdoors. And this would begin, by the way, because we have staff coming back. Um, there's not many kids in the building now, um, but I would suggest that this would begin Monday, uh, the 16th. Uh, we have uh, new staff back, teachers meetings, and what have you. Uh, so that Monday the 16th would be my suggestion of, of all this. Clear. 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 I'm sorry, no. Scratch that, my apologies. No, just indoors, uh, it was my intention. Uh, I, got, I got, got away from myself there, no, thank you. Just indoors at this point, yes. So we have a recommendation from the administration uh, for Alan personally thank each and every one of you uh, for your time and efforts put into this. Uh, this is, is not an easy decision by any means. But with the recommendation before the board, I would accept a second or a motion and a second uh, to vote on the recommendation as presented by the administration. 
Just the mask. This is just for the universal masking. I've got a motion, and I believe Susan just seconded that. Got a motion and a second to approve universal masking for all students and staff beginning August 16th, Monday, August 16th. Any further discussion on this topic, Mr. Blumberg? Um, I'm supportive of the motion. However, I believe that instead of waiting until October to revisit this, based on current data and recommendations that I'm viewing, um, we could see this variant, uh, this current spike come down before October. I'd like to see us review this at our September meeting, uh, which would allow us the opportunity then to see where we're at and potentially not wait an extra month if we're able to move sooner. Okay, Dr. Shoots just said he will provide a COVID update and we will review it at that time. Uh, just for clarification, the motion didn't have anything to do with the update. So the motion was just for, for the masking uh, effective August 16th, correct? Any further discussion? Okay, at this time, if you would, we've got a motion and a second to approve universal masking for all students K through 12, beginning August 16th, all students and staff. Uh, at this time, if you would, please vote. Motion passes five to two. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your time this evening. Uh, we will uh, have universal masking beginning August 16th for all students and staff. Uh, at this time, I'll accept the motion and a second to adjourn our meeting. Got a motion and a second to adjourn our meeting. Please vote. We are adjourned.